Come on up, come on up and sit down. Okay, so um, thank you, Rick. Thank you, everyone, for coming. So the topic for debate is uh, artificial intelligence. We appear to be reaching some kind of cultural convergence, a sort of zenith of conversations, at least in public, about what artificial intelligence is and what it can do for us. There have been a spate of films over the last couple of years, some good, some absolutely terrible, things like Chappie and oh, Transcendence, uh, Age of Ultron, Ex Machina. So um, we've had a range of views expressed by some uh, not insignificant public figures such as Elon Musk and uh, Stephen Hawking and Bill Gates about the potential threats of artificial intelligence expressed in public. So the questions that arise from that are many, and we don't have that long, but we're going to attempt to address some of them during that session. Things like, should we be concerned? Um, are we heading for the singularity? We'll be talking about that. Uh, will AIs be smarter, faster, and generally better than us? And therefore, are we destined to be subservient and possibly extinguished? by our non-human creations. Now, we will be taking questions at the end. There will be roving mics on the floor, so do come with your questions. And there are two mics uh, in, the, in the cheap seats in the balcony. Um, so our panel, we have some of the finest human minds that are thinking about these questions currently. Uh, we have, so we're going to do this in order, from the far end. Reva Melissa Tez, who is a, a transhumanist um, advocate, founder of the Berlin Singularity Group. Um, she's a tech investment consultant and a writer on AI. Next to her, we have Murray Shanahan. He's a professor of cognitive robotics at Imperial College London. He's a, he was also the scientific advisor to the recent AI film Ex Machina, which is, in my humble opinion, the best AI film um, that has been yet made, not least because I was also the scientific advisor for it. <laughs> Um, next to him, we have Nick Bostrom. He's the author of uh, Superintelligence, groundbreaking sort of alarm bell book on artificial intelligence, professor of philosophy at Oxford. And to my immediate left, we have Dan Glazer, who's a neuroscientist and director of the Science Gallery at King's College in London. So I think to start off with, we need to get a couple of definitions out of the way. I described you, Reva, as a transhumanism advocate. Briefly, what is transhumanism? Um, so I think that the first thing is that transhumanism isn't as weird as it sounds, and, and Nick is one of the founding fathers of this, of this idea, that it's the idea that we have technology, we have the capabilities to advance humanity in a way that's um, not previously uh, been established, and it's things like super health, super longevity, living for a long time as healthy as possible, um, the, the extension of healthy lifespan, super happiness, um, the abolishment of suffering, um, basically all the things that humanity has aspired for since you know, I say in America, since the Founding Fathers, um, it sounds weird now to say transhumanism, but it should be the goals of humanity to live longer and extend it and expand it. So it's, it's just the idea of using technology to, to do that. Okay, now, when we talk about uh, artificial intelligence, when we talk about consciousness, these are, at best, fuzzy concepts when we're talking about humans, when we're talking about biology, when we're talking about AI in terms of, uh, in terms of robotics, the types of things that uh, you guys do. Murray, what, what do we mean? What is artificial intelligence? What is the scope of the definition? Well, I think, first of all, we have to distinguish between different senses of the word artificial intelligence. So uh, we have to distinguish between the kind of AI technology that's actually around us today and that might unfold over the next uh, five years or so, and the kind of thing we see in the movies, human-level AI. So these are, uh, are different kinds of things. So uh, the kind of thing that we have around us today is basically uh, the, the kind of technology that carries out tasks that we think of as, as needing intelligence when they're carried out by, by humans or, or carries out some aspect of such tasks. So we see examples in, in personal assistants like S Apple Siri or Google Now Cortana. Self-driving cars are a great example. A slightly scary example is the potential of autonomous weapons. Um, and other examples are the use of machine learning technology with big data to try and understand better the um, buying habits and behavior of, of people based on large amounts of data about them. So those kinds of technologies um, are, are, are becoming very prominent. There's a lot of excitement about that kind of technology and a lot of investment in those sorts of areas. And we're no doubt going to see a lot of impact uh, on our economy and society from that kind of technology in the not too distant future. 
Now, in the more distant future, um, uh, maybe we'll one day achieve human-level artificial intelligence. And, and what I mean by that, or to distinguish that from the first kind of AI, the first kind of AI is very specialist. It, it can only do one particular task, typically. Whereas humans are capable of doing an enormous variety of tasks and, and, uh, and learning new ones and indeed inventing whole new kinds of tasks. So a human-level AI would be able to match humans in that kind of way. It would be a general, generalist. A human-level AI is, is general uh, intelligence. And we really have no idea quite how to produce that kind of AI yet. This is something that we see in science fiction films. I suspect we may well manage it by the end of this century but as yet, we really don't know how to do it. There are con several conceptual breakthroughs that are probably needed before we get there. When we do get there, um, then really all bets are off about how much impact that will have on soci society. And that's a very uh, interesting question to think about, which Nick has spent a lot of time thinking about. In fact. I want to come on to, to what's going to happen in the future in, in just a minute with Nick. But I just want to turn to Dan, because you were talking about human level intelligence and human level consciousness as being something which is in the not immediate but possible future. Dan, you're a, you're a biologist. You deal with, with real biological entities and the human brain. What can AI researchers learn from how we understand how the human brain works? Well, I think the first thing to say is that, in a sense, neurobiology and artificial intelligence are in a similar situation of being completely lost at the moment. So although there's huge amounts of investment in neuroscience, both in the US with the Big Brain Project and in Europe, uh, what we're doing is gathering huge amounts of data, but the domain is pretty much atheoretical, which is to say that nobody has any idea what's actually going on. Very basic things like sleep, uh, like memory, uh, like how anaesthetics work, we have actually no theories about what's going on there. And so the amassing of data about real brains is analogous, it seems to me, to this huge Moore's Law-driven application of computing power to AI, but without any real sense of what might be happening, what the algorithms that are going to give rise to the big breakthroughs are. And I have a, a, I mean, I'm pleased to say that I'm not the first person sitting on this stage today to advocate this, but it does seem to me that the problem with the problems we're looking at is that they're pretty male, and also they've forgotten about children. So if for years, chess was considered to be the most intelligent thing you could do, and we solved that. We solved it basically by doing exhaustive search, or close to. We just looked at all the possible moves, and eventually when the computer became fast enough to look forward far enough to outwit the grandmaster, then it could beat the grandmaster at chess. But computers are still stupid. And in fact, the things that computers find easiest to do are the things that we learn as adults, and the, thing that men, the things that men are good at, warfare, uh, you know, running corporations, this kind of planning transport systems. Uh, what they're not good is the things that uh, children are good at. So uh, generating learning environments, there's a very famous experiment with mothers and daughters. Right? It's called the tongue protrusion test. And there was an original theory that babies were mirroring their mother's uh, gestures very early on, as early as a few weeks. Why? Because when mummy sticks her tongue out, the baby sticks its tongue out too. And everyone says that that's mirroring very early. It turns out that the kid is not mirroring the mother, because if the mother goes, mm, then the kid sticks its tongue out. So what it's doing is it's expressing its excitement at being stimulated by sticking its tongue out. And the mother misreads that as mirroring, and therefore spends lots of time nurturing the child. And babies are very good mechanisms for generating learning environments from the people around them. It comes as earlier, uh, older children with the why question. So what we you know, why? Why? So what we need to become better at is understanding these very basic things. How do we generate a, a learning environment? And how do we understand better what other people are thinking? And when we get these mind-reading techniques better, we'll be able to have artificial intelligence on a firmer footing and not just go straight for the grown-up male stuff. Last point, what is it that women are better at than men? I mean, men are better at chess, perhaps. Perhaps they're better at being CEOs of tech companies. But there's a very interesting study from Anita Woolley and colleagues that was written up quite recently. If you do the IQ test on individuals, okay, you get a score. What happens if you do the IQ test on groups? So you form a group of people, and you get them to solve an IQ test together. Okay? What is the quality of the group that makes it as a group most intelligent? What they all need to be good at is eye reading. Eye reading is knowing what's going on in people's minds by looking at their eyes. That's getting mental states and inferring them from their actions. Women are much better at that than men. And the principal thing you can do if you want a group to act intelligent is to fill it with women. Actually, the most direct correlation on the study from Nita and Woolley in colleagues, if you want to measure the IQ test of a group, the biggest predictor is not the IQs of the individuals, but the proportion of women in that group. When you start to understand that 
the intelligence and the brain power that women deploy every day is something that we should be trying to model and, uh, and, and uh, drive from an artificial point of view, I think we're more likely to make progress. Dan, I'll take you on the chest. <laughs> I'm, I'm choosing to ignore the comment about uh, CEOs of uh, tech companies. Perhaps you can, you can beat Dan up later. Um, this, I guess, is directed to Murray and, and Reva, but in terms of looking at how human intelligence works and the types of models that psychologists and neuroscientists look at trying to understand the human brain and human behavior, is this the type of thing that AI researchers are modeling or should be modeling? Reva, well. Oh, well, we were just talking about this about two minutes ago, and um, the analogy that I have around neuroscience and, um, in, relation, in relation to AI is that when we try to build planes, we kind of looked at birds and we built these kind of like weird flapping things. And then we built a principle of what flight should be and then we, we managed to conquer what a plane should be. And I kind of think the same. I mean, I think the understanding and mapping the brain is a very valuable thing, but the um, like kind of non-domain specific principle of intelligence hasn't quite been conquered yet. And if we can find something that's not neuro-specific, I mean, we're, we're all so different in our you know, neuro makeup. And, um, the way that AI is being done is we're following such traditional recipes. We're looking at the brain, we're looking at like deep learning or reinforcement learning plus some part of the brain. And um, I think I agree with Murray and, and some of the people on the panel that it might be some real outlier view that, that actually cracks AI. Because um, it's, it's not like anything that's ever been done before. We don't have a, a true definition of what intelligence is. But do we have enough of an understanding of human consciousness to even model it in experimental circumstances, let alone create artificial versions? Uh, well, first of all, I think we should, we should be very clear about distinguishing between consciousness and intelligence because they're not the same thing. We can easily imagine building an artifact which is, can behave in a very intelligent way and perhaps doesn't have consciousness. And conversely, we, we have plenty of, of conscious uh, creatures in the world who are uh, certainly conscious and capable of suffering, for example, but not necessarily that intelligent compared to humans. So they're, they're very different things. But if I could just respond to, uh, to Dan's earlier uh, remarks. So cer certainly I think you're absolutely right um, and agree with everything you said. Um, uh, but uh, in defense of, of, of AI, I should point out that it's a vast subfield of artificial intelligence. There's epigenetic robotics or developmental robotics, as it's so called. There's effective computing, which, uh, uh, so, which looks at these kinds of topics as well. So it's, a, so it's certainly um, a, a perspective which is very much adopted by a great many AI researchers. But I'm slightly worried, you know, I mean, it's, it's quite fashionable AI at the moment, and, and there are lots of people, my old friend Jeff Hinton, you know, being acquired by Google, th there's lots of money coming in. But I think that there's a worry that the tech crisis about gender balance may superimpose itself onto the AI uh, problem. It feels to me as if they're addressing the wrong problems. And in a sense, the tech, you know, the Silicon Valley uh, product has been selling us problems, uh, solutions to problems that most of us don't have, like how to do sociability without eye contact. There are quite a lot of men who have problems with that, but it's not a general problem. And the solutions which people are coming up with are, that they're selling us to, are, are problems which most of us, I think, don't generally have. Nick, Murray talked about uh, the immediate future, but also the long-term future. Your, your, your book is largely about what possibly could happen and the things that people like Elon Musk and Stephen Hawking have been worried about in public. What do you think is going to happen? Well, I think that AI will gradually grow in capabilities, perhaps slowly and incrementally uh, at first, and perhaps for a long time. But at some point, we will figure out um, the basic algorithms that generate general intelligence in humans, the same powerful learning algorithms that enable us to learn not just one job, but any job, uh, the same powerful planning algorithms that make it possible for us to tackle a, like almost universal um, set of problems. Um, so once we have that sorted out, I think then we will have machines that are human level general intelligent and I'm quite agnostic as to how far we are from that point that uh, I, in fact I think nobody really has any uh, good evidence for predicting that this will or will not happen by any very specific date we did a survey of some of the world's leading AI experts two years ago and one of the questions we asked there was by what year do you think there's a 50% probability that we will have human level machine intelligence and the median answer to that was 2040 or 2050, depending on precisely which group. But with a large uncertainty on either side, it could happen much sooner or much later. But if and when we do reach that point, I think we will soon thereafter have super intelligence, the machines that 
or not just slightly better at us at some tasks, but that radically outperform us across all complex intellectual domains, much like we outperform the chimpanzees or, or like the rabbits. Um, and so with that kind of enormous intelligence comes the potential for enormous power. With that intelligence, you could reach technological maturity quickly, you're doing the inventing and the science on digital timescales. And so um, this transition to the machine intelligence era, I think, um, has the potential to be a pivotal moment in human history, perhaps the most important event that will ever have happened on, on this planet. And, and the, the ultimate outcome might depend, in some scenarios, quite sensitively on the precise initial conditions, the exact design of the first uh, entity that achieves the superintelligence. Do you think it is the accumulation? I mean, you, you sort of uh, you, you alluded to it just a minute ago, but is it, is it uh, Reva talked about how, how um, you know, uh, we can build AIs that are very good at chess, but the transferable learning and deep learning is not something that AIs are really capable of at the moment, is the main barrier that we need to accumulate uh, various skills and various intelligent behaviors into one entity? Well, I, I think it's more likely that there is one or a small number of fundamental tricks that maybe you need to flesh out with a lot of details, but a relatively limited set of basic mechanisms that generate intelligence in humans. Um, AI used to be, um, back in the 50s and 60s and 70s, really about programmers putting commands in a box. So you would hard code facts or features, and then the AI could perform some simple inferences on that. Uh, and these systems were useful for some limited purposes, but they didn't scale, they were very brittle. If you put in one wrong thing, the whole thing just turned out nonsense. But today, AI is really much more about learning. Um, it's about designing algorithms and computational architectures that from raw perceptual data, like just pixels on a screen, let us say, a large data set, can themselves figure out uh, what the relevant features are, build out context, complex representations, and, and learn to detect patterns in this. Um, and I think it's this kind of uh, learning AI that is most likely to eventually reach human level. But I'm sure it feels very much to me as if you're attacking the problem at the wrong end, because it's not, it doesn't seem to me plausible either that there are a small number of simple algorithms which if we find them will get intelligence, or that what we need to do is have more and more powerful systems to do it. I mean, one of the really striking things about humans, more than chimpanzees, is how helpless we are for so long after we're born. And it seems to me that the reason for that is because we are constructing the architecture of the machine, if you want to call it a machine, through experience. The idea that you have a big purpose, um, you know, off-the-shelf a computing machine with huge amounts of, of bits and bytes and lots of inputs and that will run an algorithm that will make us intelligent is fanciful. We need basic experience, we need to build it from the bottom up in terms of learning and, and it's this uh, helplessness in the face of the world which we need to study first. Once we've understood how that gives rise to the thinking machine right. then we can look at the algorithms that impinge. It sounds like you could reply, you're, reply briefly. Yeah, I mean it sounds like you're agreeing. So the basic idea with the learning algorithm is that it starts out helpless and then after you learn, you, you become competent, uh, just like a human child does. So you don't start out with all of these skills there, but you start out with the ability to acquire those skills. That's what learning is. Uh, in terms of what uh, AI researchers are doing currently, Murray, this is a question for you. Um, it, they, they seem to be very focused on individual tasks. So we, you know, we're a long way from what both Dan is talking about in a biological context and what Nick is talking about in a, in a broader context, but what sort of thing? Let's talk about the positives about current AI before we talk about its, uh, our ex existential threats. Mm. Well, um, of course, a lot of AI researchers at the moment are interested in, uh, in the kinds of short-term, immediate applications of the, of the sort of technology that I, was, that I was describing, especially because there's a lot of investment interest in that <laughs> at the moment. So, so there's a lot of incentive to look at that stuff. But uh, if you look at the people who, uh, who are interested in artificial general intelligence or human-level human AI as a longer-term goal, then I think pretty much uh, uh, all of them would agree very much with that perspective, that it's all about doing things from a bottom up, learning things from scratch without building in anything in advance uh, about what, or very little, about what the world is like out there. And, um, and if we look, for example, at Google DeepMind, who are one uh, uh, little 
company who are, certainly have that as, a, as, as an aim, then that's very much their, uh, their philosophy. They're interested in learning everything from scratch without building anything into uh, their, their systems about what kind of world they're going to learn about. At the moment, they're still looking at somewhat toy examples, but, but if you take that into, a, into a, um, the kind of domain that a, a human child or a, an, a, or a young animal has to deal with, then I think that's the right, okay. the right kind of approach. Okay, look, we, I think we've pretty much sorted this entire field out in the 20 minutes that, that we've had, but um, if, if there are any questions, stick your hand up and a microphone will come to you if you're on this floor. Um, so I can see there's one there. If you're in the balcony, then go to the microphone. Um, Let's, uh, let's take a couple of questions, and then I want to just briefly ask all, the whole panel about um, existential threats, as, as is the title. Hi there. Uh, ahead, David then. Benningson from a company, big data company called Signal. Um, I just wanted to know um, what you guys thought about the role that ethics plays in all of this. Obviously, <clears throat> you're talking about such a major impact that this technology in this field can have on the world, and I, I know that DeepMind incorporated an ethics board into their into their company after they were acquired. So I just wanted to hear a little bit about your thoughts on that. Who wants to have a go at ethics? Because that's a really easy subject. I, I mean, I'm just going to say that the three of us, for sure, were at the, um, there was a big AI safety conference at the beginning of this year. AI safety has become one of the most prominent areas of AI research, I think, right now. It's, we're thinking about ethics more than we are thinking about the first principles of building it, I think. Um, I think that this, Nick has done an amazing job at bringing attention to that and definitely with, with the guys at DeepMind and et cetera. So I think that, I don't know, I think that ethics is probably the biggest, one of the biggest areas of AI research right now, if not even maybe too much. And it's, 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 the, it's probably the most written about thing right now in terms of AI, not about whether or not it's being done. Is it, I mean, it's fa fabulous that we're thinking about this now. It, it's, I mean, this is early doors for talking about morality and ethics for things that haven't, that haven't really been, well, they've been conceived, but we're a long way from actually building. Yeah, I, mean, I, I would say that I think the ethical issues look very different depending on whether we're looking at near-term incremental capabilities, in which case the ethical questions are kind of continuous with other ethical questions in new technologies, so drones, should they be anonymous, privacy, all of these kind of things. So these are legitimate and worthwhile questions to think about and to debate, but I think the questions that arise even when we get machines that achieve the same general intelligence as humans have are very different and quite unique. It's entirely new kinds of ethical questions that arise here. And also questions of even if you had some views about what the ethics should be, like what kind of outcomes would be desirable, also big major research questions in how you would actually implement that in a machine, how you would create a machine that could learn um, what human intentions are, that could learn what ethics is, and then actually be motivated to pursue those, those values. That's a big new open research area that I think is going to turn out to be very important. Okay, uh, there was another question on this side, I think. Someone's got the mic right at the very back. Go ahead. Um, just not so much a question as a comment. Um, Brief, if you will. Yep, there's a guy called E.O. Wilson, long dead, sociologist, I thought socio something or other. In the 1950s, I think he said, we have paleolithic emotions, medieval institutions, and the technology of the gods. And it doesn't seem to me that much has changed since then, and that... It may be to speak to, to Daniel Glazer's point about maybe the, the, the AI you're talking about fills the gap of the medieval institutions and their inefficiencies, but does it address the fact that correlation is not the same as understanding? I don't think E.O. Wilson is dead, actually. I know is he's he not. not? But, Sorry. Um, but, yeah. so, thank, thank you, though. But, but it's, a, <laughs> it's a sign of his significance in culture that yes. he's thought to be. Um, yes. yeah, it's very I mean, old, though. I do think, if, if I can address the two points together, I think that retrofitting ethics or having an ethics committee on the side is doing the whole thing exactly back to front. One of the things that children learn early on is how they ought to behave. And I'm not going to go Freudian, but this development of a supervisory, you know, of a superego, what they should or shouldn't do, is critical to the development of an intelligent human. And it feels to me as if, and, and this is why I'm at Science Gallery London, that you've got to bring in non-scientific domains, you've got to bring in fact non-experts into the conversation, not only because there's a democratic deficit, and not only because this stuff is too important to be left to the scientists and the technologists, but because the answers to the important questions about why we're intelligent and how to make machines more intelligent, will arise in situations where we can speak to the arts, where we can involve young people in decisions, and where we can have proper interdisciplinary conversations. So we need more spaces like that, and less of the kind of algorithm bashing and, uh, and, and theoretical stuff, although that's important. It needs to be embedded in a, in a, in a proper view of human culture. Okay, we've got one minute left. 
So it needs to be an incredibly facile, quick answer to the question. Uh, and I want to go down the panel, starting with Reva. Does artificial intelligence pose an existential threat to humankind? You have 25 seconds. Yes. Murray, <laughs> maybe. <laughs> No? <laughs> <laughs> probably, well, but also an existential hope at the same time. Yes, um, maybe, probably, yes. Uh, I, I can't resist the gag. So AI, as you, many of you know, in, in the world, if you Google it, has two different significances. One is artificial intelligence and the other is artificial insemination. And I just have to say that in both cases, I'm more in favour of the natural kind. All right, well, that's, uh, as I say, I think we've really sorted that whole issue out, so well, you guys can just stop working and retire from now on. So if you could just, uh, if I could just thank the panel, um, Dan Glazer, Nick Bostrom, uh, Murray Shanahan, and Reva Melissa Tez, thank you very much.